Gelson's is entirely located in Southern California, you know, Santa Barbara to San Diego. Been here part of the Southern California culture for, for many, many years. So that's really important to us is making sure that that we have a really good representation of local items. You know, we've we hold that annual local discoveries event where we're looking for brands that are considered local to us, which is within 50 miles of any of our stores. We like to tell those local stories. But part of the reason why we just give, decided to give them a try is because they were right here and on the west side base and really resonated with the Southern California culture. So brands like that are really important. And I think it's important for our brands that are locally based like that to focus on a retail like us where they know the, the community, where people can connect with them and where they're able to get around to the stores and be able to really tell their story and connect with the, the local customer base. What's up, CPGers? Today, we've got another epic episode for you with Rich Gilmore, the VP of Center Store at Gelson's. I know you're going to love this one just as much as I did. We covered so much cool stuff from debriefing Expo West to Rich's career coming up through the ranks in the grocery business to talking through Gelson's and their format and how do they work with emerging brands. Gelson's is such an awesome tastemaker retailer in Southern California. It's a great privilege to get some time from Rich to learn all about it. I hope you enjoy just as much as I did. All right, welcome to the Startup CPG podcast. Today, we are joined by Rich Gilmore, the VP of Center Store at Gelson's, which is a tastemaker indie retailer in Southern California with 27 stores. Gelson's is a trendsetter. They've got a proven track record of discovering unique and innovative brands and promoting the California lifestyle. Gelson's has often been first to market on products that are now nationwide staples. Rich leads a dedicated team of category managers and support staff, and he's a legend in the CPG industry. With his extensive background spanning all facets of the food industry, from center store to fresh and food service, Rich brings tons of experience to the table. So, Rich, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited that we got you on the podcast. Thank you, Daniel. This is uh, pretty exciting for me as well. And, you know, I really... Love getting to interact with the community out there, especially the the startup uh, CPG brands that are out there, and and uh, through especially through your, the organization that you uh, are working with, and uh, you know it's been a, a great partnership so far, and and looking forward to uh, you know telling everybody else a little bit more about what we do here. All right, awesome. So, well, just to kick off because we're just all kind of coming back up for air after Expo West. I'm just wondering, what was your Expo West like? You probably get that asked yeah. a lot, but I think everybody yeah. would like to hear. No, yeah, it was, um, you know, I I think when you come out of it at first, you're really truthfully a little bit in a, in a daze and, and you have your first inclinations after the first day or so. But then when you look at, back at it afterwards, um, I think you have a little bit better perspective on it. What we like to do here is is after... We got to the weekend after the show and and most of the week afterwards, um, I asked the team to kind of, you know, kind of collaborate and get together and, and go over what they found and what they found was interesting. And we actually put together a deck to share with the senior executives, kind of showing the items that we think, you know, were most interesting for us and maybe talk about trends we saw. And I think it's good to give yourself a bit of a gap there um, afterwards to kind of think about it. And, um, you know, the, the thing that struck me, you know, this year was, and I think it's a good thing, is a little bit of a trend back to just more plain good food, not necessarily about gluten-free or plant-based or the keto diet or a specific, you know, attribute like that. I think one of my my most memorable Parts of the show was actually on that first Wednesday um, when they opened up that North Hall to to walk through. Just the buyers could go through it. It was nice to be able to plow through there. And I came around a corner and there was a nice looking booth with a pizza brand I hadn't seen before. And I'm very skeptical when I approach pizza brands, especially at at Expo. Um, and walked up and you know and said to them my usual spiel of you know tell me what what your story is and and you know they just said we just make good pizza. And they handed me a sample of it, and it was good old-fashioned, just, you know, gluten-full, 
you know, oily pepperoni, you know, real cheese pizza. And it was really freaking good. Um, and, you know, and, and I, and I, you know, and I had to question them, you know, is this gluten free? Is this plant based? What, what's the catch here? And, and their catch was, there was no catch. It's just good food. <laughs> it's glutinous, uh, glutinous. Yes. <laughs> Lovely. That sounds delicious. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I think I, I, there were several booths like that, that, um, I kind of encountered where, it was just good to just have good old plain old fashioned food that was that was good high quality you know was unique but wasn't uh necessarily pigeonholing itself into some you know dietary restriction so you know there's obviously a lot of that out there still which is great and there's definitely a place for it and i hope it does continue to evolve so it gets better but i just like the fact that you know there was just some Plain old fashioned good food there this year, which which I think is a, a refreshing thing to see. That's great to hear. And I'm just wondering, was there any brand that did a good job of getting you to go to their booth? Like they did a nice job of just sending you an email ahead of time, or they figured out how to like text you or how to just grab you on the floor and get your attention. But like how did they do it? What's a great yeah. way for brands to to try to do that? Yeah, that, that's a hard one. Um, truthfully, with Natural Products Expo, just because it's so huge, um, in my opinion, it's too big. I think they actually need to do something about it to to scale it back in some way and make it easier for the buyer. And because of that, you know, when brands email me ahead of time, hey, stop by my booth number thirty five hundred or whatever, that's all great and everything. But you have to realize that I get two hundred of those emails. Um, I don't read them. I mean, just to be honest, um, there's just too many of them. Um, <laughs> thank, I, thank you and, for your honesty. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the show is just so big that we know that, you know, I actually tell my team, don't make an appointment to meet up with someone because inevitably you're going to be up in the the third floor on the startup CPG aisle checking something out. and. Woo-hoo! And somebody, you have an appointment to meet someone in the North Hall 10 minutes later, and it's just not going to happen. It it really disrupts the process. So, um, you know, in my opinion, from the retailer's side, the show's there for us to go out there and find the things. And yes, everybody wants us to stop by. Everybody invites us to stop by and we try our best, but we're on a quest. It is truthfully an uh, all-out quest for my team to just get in there and find something new and different. And, and that's what we're really focused on. So, yep. you know, what, so what it really comes down to, it isn't necessarily, in my opinion, the, the footwork ahead of time or trying to set things up. It's the getting our attention as we, as we walk by. And, and that's, you know, that has to do with a, a well set up booth. It has to do with your team being interactive um, I think a lot of people would be shocked at how many booths you walk up to. And and I have a 30 second rule. If I stand there for 30 seconds and nobody says something to me, I'm moving on. <laughs> um, you know, having a team that's outgoing and reaching out and, and trying to start the conversation and selling the product. And that's really important, but it, it really has to catch the eye I, in something in a show this large. It has to give you a reason to stop in the first place, really. Um, so, so that's, that's that, really a key thing. So I like that rule. If you and let's say it's a booth that's getting a lot of attention, there are a lot of people there. Yes. I mean, I'd like to think me if I'm working that booth, I've got my eyes out. I'm looking for the badges. Yes. I'm looking for yes. you. I'm going to recognize you and be like, yeah, clear the way, you know. But what? So like, probably your rule applies, I guess. Like once you get to the front and you're waiting for them to, yes. you know, just. Address. Yeah, obviously, if if there's a crowd and there's a lot of interest, then there must be something going on, some reason why we we should be interested as well. So you will definitely you know fight to get to the front to really see what's going on. It just amazes me at how many people are standing there on their cell phones, you know. And and I know they're trying to run a business also, and I'm sure they've got a logistics issue in in Iowa that they're trying to deal with at the moment. But you know, it's it truthfully can, you know, cost them the opportunity to get to get into retail if if they're not paying attention there. So that's that's and and I trust me, I'm well aware of the struggles of a small operation and how the founder is also in charge of sales and also in charge of logistics. Um, you know, but just be aware of that when you do the show. Yes. Yes. Have to make good use of everybody's time there. It's a yeah, intense couple of days. Um and then 
I mean, and I think maybe my favorite part of the show was the panel that I got to do with you guys. So we put together this panel called Tastemakers, the SoCal Retailers. And we had a couple retailers on who were really influential in Southern California. At the beginning of the panel, I thought this was pretty interesting. I asked the audience, there were about 300 people there, who in here is from out of town? And maybe it was, you know, 80%, 90%, whatever. Yeah. And then we asked, who here visited a grocery store on the way to Expo? And probably yes. 50, 60% of people raised their hands and be like, why? It's because yes. like, man, it, the retailers here are so influential. The new products that come from SoCal and California in general and you guys and just the retailers that are really setting the trends. And so it was a super fun panel. And then as you know, we uh, we um, got about 60 brands up on stage to do 15 second quick pitches. And you yeah. were a really good sport about that. that. Was and it great. Was, wasn't it fun? Because you know, for all those brands, if they're at the panel, it's probably because they don't have a booth, which means they're very early on brands. And actually, I think for probably two thirds of them, it was their first time ever getting to pitch it. So th mm. thank you for being, because I mean, they're there just to, try to get some attention from you specifically. So thank yeah. you for doing that. Yeah. And that's really, you know, part of the reason why I, you know, like to do things like that, but it's really the reason why we're there. You know, I can tell you that you have to go into Expo West with a strategy and, you know, no offense to Chobani and, um, and General Mills, but we, the, the main floor is not our priority, right? It's we're there we're not there to find the brands we're missing that Target's carrying. We're there to find the brands that nobody's carrying or that it's just at a couple mom and pa's. And so having those small startups like you're like you're offering there that day are really the key. And then that's those are the items that we love here at Gelson's. I love to hear that. That's amazing. Um, so I would love to just get into it a little bit more, uh, especially who is the man, the myth, legend, Rich Gilmore. Can you just tell us a little bit more about your background? And, you know, I know you worked at Vons also before your 16 year career at Gelson's. How did you get into the grocery industry in general? Yeah, I think um, my story is identical to quite a large number of people out there. Um, my father worked for Vons for over 35 years. He worked for Charles Vondre back in 1949 and uh, worked with him for 25 years before he decided that he wanted to be a farmer and, and brought me and my mom and him to Colorado to be pig farmers, um, where I got to kind of learn about where our food comes from. And then, unfortunately, basically went bankrupt doing that and uh, came crawling back to Vons to get his old job back and and so therefore, when I turned 16 years old, he pulled up in front of Vons and said, get out and get yourself a job. And, you know, that obviously wasn't, I shouldn't say obviously, but that uh, is the story that I think so many people will tell is that wasn't what my plan was. When I was, you know, 12 years old, I didn't want to grow up to be a grocer. Um, you know, so you get into that, you start learning the business, you start progressing up gets to the point where, you know, I was graduating from college up in Santa Barbara and was getting married two weeks later. And I was making a pretty good living um, at the time as a full-time closing manager at, at, a, at a grocery store. And any other place that I was sending my resumes out to wasn't going to pay me close to what I was getting paid then. And I had a, you know, I was getting married, so I had some responsibilities. So, you know, I, I looked around some other places, but it just, you know, nothing was working out, but I kept moving up it in the grocery store. So, you know, I worked my way up through the store, um, like I said, as, you know, starting as a bagging groceries and working up through being a clerk and a checker and a, and a liquor clerk and working in the bakery and the kitchen. And then, you know, during my college years was a closing supervisor to the store, closing the store down at night and working night crew and all that. And then uh, worked my way through being a department manager and assistant store manager and all that at Vons. And, you know, and really, truly enjoyed it. I mean, you know, Vons was kind of a, a family for us. Um, I cut my family and worked for them for so long. And I really, you know, had a lot of pride in, in working for that company. 
you know, but as, as things go along over time, um, I had made some other connections and the opportunity came up to, uh, to make a move from being a store manager to being a category manager. And I thought that sounded really cool. Um, you know, what better job out there in the world than to get to try new and exciting stuff. And so I was able to make that move over to Gelson's at the time. But, you know, I've always really enjoyed in the store looking at the cool new items. As new items would come out, you know, I kind of, you know, would kind of check them out and read some of the the industry periodicals about what's trending and and just thought it was interesting, you know, the the new and evolution of products. So that that's why being a category manager, I think, was uh uh, my ultimate goal. And that's something I, you know, I did it for that for almost 10 years and enjoyed it a lot while, um, while doing that here at Gelson's as a category manager. So um, I love to hear I that. Sto- yeah. I love to hear that story about getting promoted from within. And I've met lots of buyers, places like Walmart, like everywhere who started out in the stores and, you know, from bagging groceries all the way up to just a, you know, really influential position of the company. Um, yes. But of course, there are a lot of people who don't make that leap. Um, what do you what do you think the key is to rising through the ranks that way from, you know, let's say entry level at the store all the way to central office, you know, buying decisions, yeah. corporate side? I, I think it's really it's about the passion. Um, it's about the interest in the items, you know, learning more about it and, you know, being innovative, finding new ways to merchandise things, finding new ways to push things to drive sales. And really, you know, reaching out and interacting with with people in the office. If you're in the stores, you know, reaching out to the office to ask questions about items, to make suggestions. You know, it can be intimidating, but the truth of the matter is, is that most of the people in the office came from the same position as as the store people. And, you know, I'll tell you, I, I've been through a lot of industry events over the past, you know, 35 years. And grocery people are, they're Fairly, most of them are pretty nice, you know, so, you know, just reaching out and getting your, that connection, interacting with people in the office, I think is really important just to show you have the interest to show you have the passion. Um, that's really where it, what it all comes down to in my, in my mind, it's about, it's about that passion. You need to have passion about, about it. It's not just a job. It's not just a punch in the clock and, and doing some paperwork, it's about really having interest in what it is that you're doing. I love it. I was just reflecting on that. I think you're totally right. And just like our passion and like, you know, are your wheels churning, trying to figure out how to make an impact, right? And yeah. like improve the experience for the shoppers or improve things for the team in some way. Like you can tell who are the people who really care and are curious and driven to think about that stuff. Like, I think that's the passion that you're talking about exactly. and, and who's exactly. there to like kind of punch in and punch out. Exactly. You know, and, and some people misinterpret that as saying, you know, you need to work the extra hours or you need to be, you know, going, you know, doing things that you're not really paid to do or things like that. Um, and that's not what it means. That It means that, you know, that you really care about what you do day in and day out. And it's, you know, I, I can't imagine doing something that I didn't care about because if you don't care about it, you're not going to necessarily do a very good job of it. I don't think. Um, yeah. So I think that's really important for people to find things that they are really interested in, in and really do care about. I think that's right. And the things that you do care about, you're you're not maybe even on the clock when you do it, but your brain is just, you know, always coming up with ideas and thinking of things and yes. it's going to, it's going to orient itself to the things that you care the most about. So if you're really yes. passionate about your job, even when you're out of there in the time that you're walking down a hallway at night, if your brain is just, you know, running its gears on the stuff that you're passionate about at work, it's going to yep. be coming up with ideas. Yep. And even when you're out on vacation, I mean, uh, my wife drives, you know, I drive my wife crazy when you know, we're driving across Canada last summer and I have to stop at some grocery store we just zoomed by because it looked interesting from the outside. And and it's it's not because I'm looking, you know, doing competitive checks. It's just I want to see what's I think it's going to be cool, you know, and and I would enjoy doing that. So, yeah, absolutely. Me too. Uh, grocery store tourism. I'm, I'm a, very into that. <laughs> um, so speaking of grocery stores. Can you tell everybody who hasn't had the pleasure of checking out a Gelson's, what's it all about? You know, what is the, if you're walking in for the first time, what does it feel like? What's the store like? You know, what are the shoppers like? All of the good stuff. 
Definitely. Um, you know, I think, first of all, there may be people that visited Gelson's 15, 20 years ago and have an image of Gelson's and then what Gelson's is today also. Um, so, yeah, we operate 27 stores here in Southern California. We go as far north as Santa Barbara, down to San Diego um, and out to the desert in Rancho Mirage. Um, you know, we started, you know, just as a few um, family owned operations here in the Valley started in Burbank back in the fifties and, um, you know, really grew as a company organically over the years, just opening stores up here and there. Um, but we've discovered that it really takes a certain type of location for Gelson's to succeed. I mean, we will all admit that Gelson's has opened stores and closed them over the years just because they didn't end up being a right fit. Um, which I think any retailer finds, but, you know, it needs to be a location that does have a clientele that's interested in unique and possibly high end items, high quality items, isn't necessarily af afraid to pay a little bit more to get those high quality items and really focused on service, you know, and I think, you know, 20 years ago, it was really kind of an old fashioned store kind of antiquated in my opinion focused on you know the the cream of wheat and the the everything that you know a elderly clientele might might like and um and on specialty you know really you you know more specialty high and unique items like that where you could find a really cool you know aioli or or something along that lines um but Truthfully, about, you know, 15 years ago when Whole Foods is really going through their big growth phase there and, and the natural product world is really exploding, you know, Gelson's, we, we kind of took a bit of a pivot and really tried to refocus in on the more natural side of the business. And I think that we fulfill a very unique position in the marketplace, especially in Southern California. Um, some people say that you can't be everything to everyone, which is true. You can't be. Um, and it's usually best to be, you know, I remember my Vaughn's days, a certain CEO over there um, used to say that you had to choose whether you were going to be the best at being the low price operator or you could be the best at the high end operator but it's really difficult to operate right in the middle. And, and that's something that I think that we've found some good success in, in that you can come to a Gelson's and you can buy your flaming Hot Cheetos and you can also get that unique probiotic soda that nobody else in town carries. You know, and when we think about what the strategic advantages, you know, that Gelson's has, it, it's kind of based around that and that, you know, uh, that customer that isn't, the entirely organic and refuses to eat anything else and wants a uh, retailer to tell them what they can eat. And that it's also not a, you know, a conventional retailer that just carries everything you can think of. It's a lot more curated and a lot more focused on making sure that you've got both, you know, you can come in and you can buy your 12 pack of Coke and you can buy that cool kombucha or you can get that, you know, handmade kale salad over in the deli or you can get the certified Angus beef prime ribeye, you know, in the meat department. Um, and you can't get all three of those things at one location anywhere else in town. Um, so that's where we've really been able to position ourselves. And our customers have really, you know, grown loyal to it. And, you know, we've had to evolve with that customer base as the customer base has evolved over the years with being a little more focused on natural. But the key thing in the past five years that, that you know, our team has really been focusing on is being that first to market on new, innovative, cool items, especially in the natural side, you know, and trying to beat, you know, the conventional retailers to market with, with lots of those items. That's, that's awesome to hear. That really resonates with me. Um, and it reminds me, actually, when I did a podcast with Jonathan Lawrence from Fresh Time, he mentioned that they had actually gone pretty far in on exclusively natural products before and then had actually rotated a bit back. Um, and, you know, the example we were talking about is I was like, yeah, I mean, for me, I'm, I would maybe want to prioritize organic produce, for example. But 
when I walk to the deodorant aisle, I'm still pretty basic. I'm buying degree or mm-hmm. something because I don't know. I still haven't found a really high end organic one that I feel like makes me not smell bad. So I'm yeah. still, I would still yeah. want the kind of like staples well, I, that I'm used to, but then yeah. I, I also want some upscale options that I love. And so yeah. that, that speaks to me. And I think, you know, what he was saying is like, we don't want a consumer to have to then go to like CVS or do another shop right. to then fill up the basket. Like you can come here and get all the stuff for that kind of yeah. a consumer. So, you know, that speaks to me, me as I also have you know, kind of basic taste buds in a lot of instances. So like, I do want stuff that they're not only going to be selling at Whole Foods or, you know, Erewhon yeah. or whatever. And that, but I, that also, that makes sense to me because, so I used to run a beverage company in the energy drink category. And so when I was touring your stores, yeah, I would see the newer, um, you know, high end kind of new to market type stuff, but then I would also see Red Bull and Monster on there. And so yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me, like, you know, given what you're saying about why that is and why you have those in the assortment. And I think, you know, you wouldn't necessarily feature those ones with like the most prominent, like, yeah. you know, as many facings as you might see at like a Safeway or something, but they're, they're yeah. there and people can get them. And we know, like, I have friends who are, you know, doing the sea moss gel and all that other stuff. Yes. But also they go yes. out at night and have like a Red Bull and vodka and they want to be able yeah. to get that. So how yeah. do you how do you make the decisions then about like what are the staples we want to make sure that we have on shelf and like how much space you're going to allocate to them versus the stuff that's newer to market and you yeah. know, more like natural products? And that, that's hard. I mean, truthfully, that's probably one of the hardest things. Um, you know, when I can think of back when we got a, a new category manager, I don't know, five, six years ago. And we're walking the the deli section, the lunch meat section, and they're like, "Why in the world do you have Oscar Mayer, you know, deli thin turkey slices? You know, we, we've got all this great selection of Applegate and Organics and Distol and and all these, you know, high end, you know, high quality products." And then I'll, I pull, I'll pull up the category movement and show the number one selling item is that Oscar Mayer turkey, you know, but the next four are the Applegate, right? So, you know, it's it's a really, you, you have to look at the numbers um, and you have to realize where that balance is, um, you know, but at times we do have to take it, uh, a leap of faith where you've had that item that is, you know, it's not a top seller anymore. It's really trailed off. But you just think about, you know, well, Mrs. Mrs. Smith at the Tarzana store has bought it for for from our store for 50 years, and she's not going to be happy if we get rid of it. But you have to really use analytics and really look at it to see what that item is really doing for you to to, to make that decision. You know, and I, I can admit we've gone overboard sometimes, you know, or we've over skewed in a in a category. You know, plant based was a great example of that several years ago where, you know, we were all in on plant-based and expanding the sections and adding, you know, discontinuing 20 SKUs of yogurt to put in 20 new SKUs of plant-based yogurt. And, and it didn't, you know, we, we went too far, you know, and so you have to reverse course, but you have to be um, agile enough to do it fairly quickly also. And Mm -hmm. I think that's one good thing that, you know, with our store count and our, the way our operation is, is that we're able to make those adjustments without having to wait for the next cycle of something next year or, or something like that, we can, we can reverse course pretty quickly. Oh, and one thing I wanted to ask you, since you mentioned Oscar Mayer and also the pig farmer uh, family background, a lot of people mentioned about Expo West in the debriefs out there, the hot dog trend that they saw this year. And I got yeah. to check out the impossible hot dog, which I actually thought was really good. Yeah. Um, what, did, what did you, did you try any of the hot dogs out there? And what do you think about you know, that as a frontier? <laughs> For plant-based. Yeah. You know, I've had my share of plant-based hot dogs and I'm sure they're probably a lot better than they used to be, but, um, I, I didn't necessarily try them. Um, (laughs) but with that said, I mean, we sell a ton of hot dogs, so, you know, there, there's definitely a space for it. It's never going to be 50% of the market or anything like that, but, you know, and, and that's what really, category manager comes down category management really comes down to right is looking at that customer decision tree and deciding what gap each item fills if the item is 
just a me too, it's not going to do, do any good. But is it filling some gap that you have in your assortment and, and really looking at it closely in that way? So, you know, speaking of making decisions for the category managers and the assortments, so given that you carry some products that are from big CPGs, right? You know, Cheetos and you got like Pepsi and, you know, Coca-Cola, Mars, Unilever, like you carry brands from those. So what does that look like for your category managers? You know, how much of their time is spent meeting with the reps from those kind of companies versus looking for more of the new and emerging stuff? Like I imagine, yeah. may, like, is it less of their time that they have to dedicate to that stuff? Cause it's kind of, you know, like, are just kind of swapping out some, taking on some new innovation from them, but you know, largely just keeping the staples and they spend more time with the new brands or how does that balance work? Yeah, I really, it does work out a lot that way that that's, that's truthfully what a majority of the time the category manager spends is meeting with brands. You know, they, they're they doing, you know, two or three meetings every single day with, with different brands, um, sometimes five or six, depending on the day. And a lot of those are just brand new brands that are doing the first pitch to them. You know, when it comes to maintaining an existing um, assortment or s- promotional planning, things like that, a lot of that can be done a little more automated through emails and and things around that sort. Um, but like you said, Frito, it's kind of on, and you know, we did meet with them a couple times a year and really come up with the plans, and then we just execute those plans. But they were, truly do spend a majority of their time looking for new items. That's that's what we really hang our hat on. So, you know, every category manager is authorizing, you know, probably you know. It probably averages around 100 SKUs every month of, of just plain new items that, that they've found out there. And so it adds up pretty quick and it takes a lot of time. But that's that's really the best way to grow a category, in my opinion, is is getting new items. You, wow. You're, so each category manager, you said, is adding 100 new items a month? Probably. It's, it's, you know, it varies from month to month, obviously, depending on what's going on. If you do a yogurt review, there's probably going to be a ton, you know, but... Uh, one month compared to the next, but it um, they they see a lot of products, and we're this team we have right now, especially, is really great at finding cool new items and, and getting them set up, you know, through a distributor and you know on our shelves pretty quickly compared to you know what we used to do. That's very helpful information to remind us why we don't always hear back immediately when we send in an yes. email. So that's, that makes a lot of sense. Um, they so, are very busy. So, you know, you know, it's going to take a couple tries. I, I'll tell everybody that. Up <laughs> so speaking of tries and trying to get on people's radar, um, I, I had a pretty good experience when I pitched to Gelson's. Um, so right when I moved to L.A., I think a year and a half ago, actually, you had partnered with Naturally on a kind of first pitch type opportunity for member brands. And I was, I had just joined the chapter and I was lucky enough to get one of those meetings, came out to the Gelson's HQ, which was cool. Um, And I think that was the first time I actually got to meet you in person and ended up pitching to one of your team members, got through the next round to talk to the buyer, didn't make it in that first round, but then we were on the radar and kind of in contact and then managed to get in, in the next review cycle or the one after that. So um, yeah. You know, pretty cool process. Is that, you know, a typical kind of story or how are you seeing brands get through the 200 email clutter and get on your radar or your category managers radars? Yeah, that's that's obviously the hardest part, you know, and obviously, you know, that was a great opportunity when we did that naturally local discoveries um, program that that you were in. That's one way that we do that. We only do those maybe once a year. Um, just because it takes a lot of planning to set those up. But, you know, it's just the, it's the following up with the brands. Um, and, you know, maybe you know, the category managers would kill me to say this, but if you, you know, getting samples to them somehow, you know, I'm not saying send samples without any information. That's, that's you know, especially for dairy or frozen, because you have very limited storage space, that becomes annoying also. But you know, you just have to keep trying. Um, and your message in your first communication needs to be, you know, explaining why yours is different than everybody else. You know, you know, there's a lot of people out there that think they make the best hummus. Okay, well, that's, that's great. I'm sure your hummus is really good. 
there's a lot of hummus out there though, right? There's, you know, probably 30 different brands that have I've spoken to in the past year that want to be in Gelson's. And we've got space for three brands. Um, you know, there's only so much you can do. And no, we're not going to discontinue Sabra. It's the market leader. Um, and it sells. Um, no, we're not going to discontinue Gelson's brand hummus. It's Gelson's brand hummus for a reason, right? So, you know, there's not a lot of space there. So it's, you know, don't come in and say, I make really good hummus. What's different about your hummus is the question, right? Um, why is yours better than everybody else? And it can't be, oh, it's my grandma's recipe or, oh, we use all natural ingredients. There needs to be something there that's saying why it's different. What gap in the customer decision tree is it filling? You know, so don't just come out, you know, no offense to all those hummus brands out there, but don't just come out with a really good hummus. Make sure your hummus is different than everybody else's. And, you know, it, it, so, okay, in that instance where there are only three slots, man, that's going to be competitive because you're right. There are a lot well, of hummus brands out there. So let's say they go with the approach of trying to convince you to expand because it's incremental opportunity and, hey, like, you know, hummus is growing overall as opposed to some of the other alternatives that are sitting next to it in your shelf. Yeah. Like, have you seen people do that pretty effectively? Because, you know, some, like I feel like I've tried to tell that story with some yeah. data and I, it didn't really land. And then I've had other times where they were like, yeah, nodding along. Like, yeah, that's what I yeah. believe that we're going to create more space for you. Well, you have to realize how difficult that is. You know, we have planograms. All of our stores are planogrammed. We have a three foot, maybe a six foot section of hummus and dips in all of our stores. And yes, I would love to add three more feet onto every store, but I'm going to have to take three feet off of something else. And the our, our, if you look at our cases, where you've already got the smallest section of, of most retailers out there, if you compare us to a Vons or a Ralph's, it's like half the number of doors. So, you know, what's the solution? And even if there is a solution, who, how do we get the time to go around and reset all of those stores? You know, there's only so many people we have that are able to go around and do that. It's not like we can just send an email to the stores and say, hey, flip this off, you know, and, and it'll all change overnight. It, it's not that simple. So, um, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's what makes it so difficult. So it, it really, you have to, you have to really sell the fact that you're the, the best. And, and we're looking, for something different, right? Like I said, in in we understand that we only have that much space, and maybe that means we do have to discontinue something that still sells well, but we just need to make it more exciting. You know, the, we've got some categories where you know if you're selling, you know, two units a week per store, then then you're great. If, but we have other categories that if you're not selling. 10 units a week per store, then then you're probably going to get discontinued. So it just really depends on the space. And we're always remodeling stores and always adjusting space that way. But it's 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 a long process. It takes a long time to transform. Um, what, about that. what are some of those highest velocity expectation categories? Like I imagine some of it's like grab and go, like, you know, RTD, like chilled RTDs yeah. or. Yeah. Especially in today's world. I mean, that's. You know, that's one thing I said in my LinkedIn post is that I think I tasted 200,000 functional beverages expo. <laughs> um, if you're thinking of starting a new business, don't start a functional beverage business. It's it's saturated. Um, but that's where the movement is, right? Um, all of these companies out there, um, I, the innovation, it's always something new, whether it's, you know, the the functional side of it or it's the euphorics or the the mushroom based or all these different possible things that they're coming up. It's always evolving, but that core category overall, that that's where there's a lot of volume because you're competing for the same space as Coke and, and Celsius and, and all these other, you know, really uh, fast moving products that have a lot of money behind them. They're advertising all over television and, and they're supporting the, the Lakers and the Dodgers, right? So it's a lot of competition out there. So in the beverage categories like that, um, especially that's probably the top highest volume. Um, and then chips and snacks, you know, salty snacks, that whole area. It's just so much innovation too, but the, the core items sell like crazy. That's pretty interesting to hear your perspective on it. And I think it's true. Um, so when I was 
selling the energy drink brand into retail, it was really falling on the Celsius craze. And so all of a sudden, there was so much competition in the market. People had seen how well they had done. Um, also, they had just done the deal with Pepsi. And so they were commanding a lot of shelf, shelf space because of it. And so it made it difficult. Like we were battling to try to get authorization. So was everybody else. And it was, yeah, it's very, a very hot space. It was growing a lot according to data, but yeah, that's why there are a lot of people in it. And then we launched a new product line that was Yerba Mate. And I was actually really um, surprised and excited to see a lot of the buyers were just saying, oh yeah, I have space for that. Cause that was yeah. a much newer emerging um, growing cat segment of the category. And so I kind of see what you're saying of like, yeah, maybe don't just lob something into the overall set that's growing, that has all that competition, but at least maybe find a segment of it that isn't quite as overfished yet. Yes. Um, right? Yeah. Um, yes, exactly. I also, uh, just going back to your your comment about finding a way to get buyer samples, I, I love it when people hustle and figure something out. Like I think even with you guys specifically, when I did get the chance to send the buyer's samples, you know, I'm not putting it in the mail. I'm like, oh, great. I'm actually going to be in the neighborhood. I'll just come by and, yeah. you know, and make the drive over to Encino and, you know, just make yeah. sure I'm there to at least drop it with a note if they're out to lunch or something. But yeah. like, yeah. you know, just even the chance to get to say hello or something like always make, you know, it makes a big difference, even though I'm sure yeah. you don't want everybody dropping by your office yeah. or anything. <laughs> right. Well, it, and these days too, I mean, obviously the workplace has evolved and, Truth of the matter is, is that our category managers actually work from home some days. So you might show up and they're not going to be here. So um, frankly, yeah. if you show up, you're probably not going to get let in the door these days anyways. But um, <laughs> that's, you know, that's, that is kind of a big pet peeve of a lot of category managers is just having stuff, you know, shoved down their throat. But I fully understand the perspective from the salesperson side as well. It's like, what are they supposed to do? Um, cause there is so much out there you, and so many emails that you can just get so lost in there. Yep. Makes sense. Uh, that's, that's the game. So, um, let's say they do successfully get on the radar then, and they're having a dialogue with buyer and get to the point of actually doing a submission. Like, how do you like to partner with brands? What's going to be the kind of home run in a submission? And I know, I know, for example, that you guys really favor the sampler box that you do with consumers where they get a chance to try stuff that's new. Yeah. Um, you know what? Yeah. What's the stuff that really makes it a no brainer for your category manager once they're interested in a product? Right. Um, you know, I always tell everybody, it doesn't matter how good your product is. You have to sell it. And, you know, there's so many brands out there that they go to, they get a tent at the farmer's market and they stand there and they're hand selling to thousands of customers walking by every day, all day long. And the customers love it because the product's great, but you can't be standing there hand selling to every single customer in 27 different grocery stores, 24 hours a day. Um, so you have to come up with a plan that's going to sell your product without you being there. And that's where I think a lot of brands, especially small ones kind of lose that because they're so set on the fact that their high qual their product is so high quality it sells itself you know how many times have i heard the words it sells itself um nothing sells itself because it's a, just another can sitting on the shelf you know there's too many other options out there and everybody defaults to what they're comfortable with they you can stand there in front of 200 different varieties of energy drinks and it gets overwhelming and what 90% of the time that customer is just going to buy the same thing that they always buy you know, it's kind of like when I go to Cheesecake Factory, I I look at the menu and say, I'm going to try something new this time, but I never do just because <laughs> people like people <laughs> like to default to what they're used to and what they like, you know, of course. And fun fact, Rich goes to Cheesecake Factory. Let's go sometime, man. I live I live next to the one in Marina Del Rey. All and right, it, actually, it actually has the most beautiful view because it's right over oh, yes. us. Mother's Beach. It's, it's incredible. I nice. I went there Very twice, nice. twice during Expo West <laughs> to, <laughs> with our, for our team dinner. It's just nobody. Love it's it. so easy. Um, Love it. So but yeah, um, but think about that. that. That the case, the shelf of the grocery store is kind of like the Cheesecake Factory menu. It's just got a, it's, <laughs> it's got too many, you know, choices, right? So yeah, you have to do something to get the person's attention. That's the only way to do it. I love it. And, um, Oh, I get one question I had for you was around how much do you prioritize California brands, you know, California lifestyle? I remember actually in that first pitch that I got to do with you guys, 
I think there was a priority, at least for that initiative around, you know, we're looking for brands that are headquartered around here or produce around yeah. here, or at least, you know, resonate with consumers who are in SoCal. Right. It's going to feel like a fit for them. Right. So, you know, Gelson's is entirely located in Southern California, you know, Santa Barbara to San Diego. Um, there's not many retailers that can say that of our size, especially. And we grew up here, right? That's we were founded in Burbank. Our second store was the store right here in Encino, you know, been here part of the Southern California culture for for many, many years. Um, so that's really important to us is making sure that that we have a really good representation of local items. You know, we've um, we hold that annual local discoveries event where we're looking for brands that are considered local to us, which is within 50 miles of any of our stores. So it could be Central Coast to the Mexico border or out to the desert. That's, you know, we're flagging that as local in our store. We're promoting it as local. We like to tell those local stories, you know, and and we've had some some home runs, you know, from those local events. But even if we're not having a local event, if there's a local producer, you know, that comes in and tries to get in the door, you know, you know, there's been many over the years, you know, we think about, you know, brands like Health Aid, um, when they were just selling from the back of their truck at, at farmer's markets, and then they came into us in, in, to meet with me one day, you know, 15 years ago. And, you know, we, we decided to give them a try. Um, but part of the reason why we just give them, decided to give them a try is because they were right here and on the West side based and, and really resonated with uh, the Southern California culture. So brands like that are really important. And, and it's, I think it's important for our brands that are locally based like that to focus on a retail like us where they know the, the community where people can connect with them and where they're able to get around to the stores and be able to really tell their story and connect with the, the local customer base. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. So speaking, you know, speaking of health aid, like, you know, early days, probably that it, the data would not have told you to lean in on something like that. Have, yeah. Are there any other examples where, you know, it wasn't necessarily the data that drove a decision, but it was more gut instinct about something that was really going to be innovative or, you know, coming yeah. up on trend that ended up performing really well? Yeah, I think, I think that's part of um, an important, you know, kind of non- quantitative part of being a category manager that I think a, a person to be successful as a category manager, they need to have that instinct be, to be able to look at something and say, Hey, that just looks interesting. This, this is, this is connecting somehow with me. And, and it's not even, like you said, you're not able to apply any data to it. It's not because of a specific thing, you know, you're looking for it just kind of it just clicks in your head that this is this is something interesting. You know, there's been many brands like that with that I can think of. They personally have found over the years, but um, you know, lots of people in our team that have just stumbled across things. Um, you know, more. You know, I can think of a few years ago when when Truff Hot Sauce came in and and nobody else was carrying it around, and it it's got truffle in it. It's the hot sauce for with truffle in it. That's what more Gelson's could there be, right? Um, <laughs> you know, things like that that just kind of clicks with you. And then the alternate is is sometimes it just it, it isn't clicking because none of us are perfect. I think back to you know GT kombucha presented to me like four times in a row, and I told them this stuff's disgusting. Nobody's ever going to drink it. But then all of a sudden they showed me the data that it was the number one selling item at Whole Foods. And I'm like, all right, I guess we'll try it. You know, and six months later, it's the number one selling brand in the entire dairy department. So can't say that, that we're always, you know, able to see into that crystal ball. But um, so data is important, obviously, when you are being successful somewhere. We, I would always say, come to us and show us the data, you know, show us the movement you're doing, show us, you know, and hopefully we're seeing it in spins. Um, or something like that. But at the same time, it just, it has to, you have to look at it and be, just be able to say, that's cool. And when I'm walking up and down the aisles at Expo West, they, you know, there are several times when I'm walking down the aisle and just literally out of the corner of my eye, I just see something I was about to plow through it, but just, I see the package and something clicks and you have to stop and you go back to 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 stop and talk about it just because of that. Yeah, I don't know why, but that reminds me of, you know, when we were going through sensory for product development, I, I felt like I had a pretty good knack for 
knowing what I like and knowing why I like it and what I wanted to change and, you know, what I didn't like about it and being able to communicate that to the product developers. And that, you know, it's a really useful thing to be able to do, um, to have, I would say, you know, a strong palette and be able to do it. I would say the next level that I didn't really get to is, okay, but I know what I like and what I don't like, but I am not that good at tasting things for other people. Like, okay, let's say that this product is for a different kind of consumer. And I think the kombucha is a great example because- yes. I mean, like, you know, here's the the Daniel tell all, like, I don't really like kombucha in general. I don't know uh-huh. why. For me, it's like very yeah. sour. I, I'm not sure it I is. understand. I know it's supposed to be really like, you know, gut healthy and stuff, but like, I'm not yeah. going to drink it. So like, I, it would be very hard. I, I could tell you which of the kombuchas I find, you know, most palatable of what's out there, but I wouldn't yeah. be able to tell you what one of these very evolved SoCal healthy, yeah. you know, eaters and drinkers, which one they're going to like. So yeah. I think that's hard, right? For category managers to know like, yeah, kombucha is on trend. And here, and if even if they're not somebody who drinks kombucha, here's the one that I think is going to be interesting to kombucha drinkers yes. or people who are open to that. Yes. You know, and it, and it goes across the board too. Um, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, our, our, well, Gelson's customers don't like spicy things, you know, because for some reason years ago, I mean, when we sell salsa, the mild one sells best. I mean, that's, doesn't surprise me. You know, I don't think that would surprise anyone. Um, but some people start to say, well, the Gelson's customers don't like spicy things. Okay. So then, you know, why do we sell so many flaming hot Cheetos? Right. I mean, it's a bad example, but it's, it's the truth, right? We, we need to, we always need to make the decisions based off of our customer. Cause if we only carried what we liked, it would be a very limited palette and we would probably be missing out on a lot of things. And I, it's interesting. I think things are changing. I don't have the data on this, but, you know, when you look at chili oil, like fly by Jing and yes. you know, a lot of, a lot of people use, eat that who I wouldn't yeah. expect traditionally were people who loved hot things. Um, and then maybe that expands their openness to stuff that's not so mild in other categories as yeah. well. So uh, interesting Definitely. to think about how like a product could influence people's taste in other categories as well. Um, so Rich, one question I'm really dying to ask you about is you're a board member for the Western Association of Food Chains. Now, this is an organization that I had not heard about before moving to California. Yeah. And it, it's really interesting to me because this is a very influential organization. There are a couple out here like that and California Grocers Association. Yeah. And like you wouldn't hear about this uh, a lot on LinkedIn or in, you know, the trade magazines or, you know, even at a conference talking to people, but actually like these are hugely influential organizations yeah. that where that are just stacked with buyers and people who are really important in the retail industry that like, you know, some, I mean, the people, people should know a lot more about. So I just yeah. wanted to ask if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, what that is and when, what led you to be involved in it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the WAFC is the Western Association of Food Chains. Um, It's actually an organization entirely focused on education. So I went to the USC Food Industry Management Program back in 1999, 25 years ago, um, when I was two. And, um, (laughs) and, you know, I, it's a 16 week program where you're actually on campus at USC going to class every single day with people from, I was at Vons at the time, but I was in class with people from Albertsons and people from Ralph's and people from Bashes and people from King Supers and people from Gelson's, uh, which is part of the reason why I work at Gelson's now is because one of my classmates was uh, the vice president here. And, um, you know, you get to learn a lot about the industry, but the WFC funds that program um, through the fundraising that they do. And then they also do um, lots of other educational initiatives around, um, the food industry through community colleges and organizations like that. Um, and they do that all through their fundraising, through their, their conventions. So every year, the first week of May, they have their annual convention, which for any brand is a great way to connect with the executives at these companies. Like you can literally end up sitting at a table presenting your product to the senior vice president of purchasing of that company or even the president of that company. You know, all of the companies, the, all of the main grocery chains in Southern California, you'll see everybody from Vaughn's there, everybody from Ralph's, everybody from Gelson's, Stater Brothers, um, Smart and Final, 
you know, and and we all work together on this board. You know, I'm on the board with Greg McNiff, you know, from Stater Brothers and Matt Reed from Smart and Final. And Adam Caldecott was also my teammate um, back at FIM. And we're on the board together um, now. And he's, you know, the CEO of Bristol Farms. You know, and I don't think anywhere else in the country would you find grocery retailers that are competitors like that sitting in the same room trying to kind of find up ways to educate our employees uh, more. And it works also with the, the CPG side, right? Through the illuminators and through those types of organizations that that work with the WAFC. And you come to these conventions so that you can meet with these executives, you can hang out at the bar with these executives, you can, you know, have the way to draw, grow those connections. And that's a huge thing for a lot of brands. I know, you know, some real small startup startups wouldn't be able to afford the expense that might come along with that. But when you are able to, I think it is uh, a really vital part that along with the CGA events that you see all the time, um, the Illuminator events, um, those are all great organizations that really Southern California is pretty unique in having so much of this interaction between um, CPG brands and all of the retailers that are involved. Yeah. I, and I, I really appreciate you sharing that because that is one of the organizations. I think it's kind of like under the radar for early brands and they should know about it because Yes. You, you, like if you find somebody who's really in the know, they'll know that as kind of like a trade secret of like, oh, no, there's like very, very, very good opportunity if you can try to get involved in those kind of organizations. I remember my friend Jess Rodlin um, was the first person who told me about the Olive Crest event, um, which, you know, that's it's a charity that a lot of the retailers in SoCal support. And I was like, oh, what is this? OK, cool. Yeah. Like we'll go support the charity and do a booth there. And man, it was just us and a bunch of buyers from SoCal retailers like across the board. It's like, what is this? This is this is amazing. This is very different from some of the other trade shows out there. And then, um, yeah, I've gotten to know some other people, and I uh, I I know that um, you know Sabrina from Illuminators um, facilitated a pitch competition with WAFC um, yes. last year, and I had applied for that because I was like, oh, I know what this is and how good of an opportunity it yeah. is. And yeah. uh, I narrowly missed apparently getting selected for it, but I saw my friend Clara from Unite Foods got into mm-hmm. it, and um, and my, and one of my friends from business school also who has a brand called Mocktail Club got into it, and I messaged both of them like, "Well, congrats!" Because I don't know if everyone out there knows how big of a deal that is, but I do, yes. and I just really want to congratulate both of you on it. And they went, and they were like, "Yeah, it was what you think it is. It was incredible." Um, so good. I'm I, yeah. Thank you for um, helping me. Uh, illuminate everybody out there uh, yes, about definitely. some of these organizations. So, um, Rich, man, thank you. I, I, this was incredibly interesting for me to go through a lot of this, um, the background on your career and Gelson's, and I think just a ton of really cool tips for people. Because I mean, I think you know pretty much any brand that I know would be dying to get into Gelson's. I remember back when I worked at Just Egg. I was asking around like, hey, what's the data story that uh, we should tell for this retailer we're pitching? And everyone was like, look at Gelson's because I think we had gotten a secondary display there and the velocity was nuts. It was yeah. just like something we had never seen before. And so, you know, I just was always so interested to learn more about Gelson's and how you partner with brands. So thank you for sharing all of that. And um is there a good way for brands to kind of follow along with like you or Gelson's in general? Like, you know, can people reach it? Like, you know, try to follow you on LinkedIn or, you know, what's a good way to, for people to follow the journey? Yeah, I, um, LinkedIn's a great way. Um, you know, we've got a lot of innovation coming up in the future. We're opening some convenience stores and things like that. So LinkedIn's a great way to learn about that. Um, I'm actually a huge supporter of LinkedIn. I think it's important for um, employees just to be, you know, trying to promote their companies through LinkedIn, especially in an industry like ours, where I want brands to know what we're doing and I want brands to want to be in our stores. So um, it's good to get the word out there about what we are doing to those brands, especially. All right. I cannot wait to check out those convenience stores. That sounds incredible. Yeah, it's going to be fun. All right. Rich, thank you again so much. On behalf of me and and the whole community, we really appreciate um, all of the stuff you do to make yourself accessible to emerging brands. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Likewise. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks. 
All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the podcast today, it would really help us out if you can leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I am Daniel Scharf. I'm the host and founder of Startup CPG. Please feel free to reach out or add me on LinkedIn. If you're a potential sponsor that would like to appear on the podcast, please email partnerships at startupcpg.com. And reminder to all of you out there, we would love to have you join the community. You can sign up at our website, startupcpg.com, to learn about our webinars, events, and Slack channel. If you enjoyed today's music, you can check out my band. It's the Super Fantastics on Spotify Music. On behalf of the entire Startup CPG team, thank you so much for listening and your support. See you next time.